Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's side event at the 2021 ECOSOC Youth Forum. Our event is titled Recalibrating and Rethinking Sustainable Future, the Importance of Health, Wellbeing and Empathy. My name is Trisha and I'll be moderating the event today. I'm a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts Psychology of Peace and Violence program and an intern with the Psychological Study of Social Issues, issues also known as SPICI, NGO Committee at the UN. I wanted to provide a brief overview of SPICI for those who might not be familiar. SPICI was founded in 1936 and is composed of over 3,000 psychologists who share a common interest in research on the psychological aspects of social and policy issues. Some of the topics our group has worked on over the years include poverty, peace and conflict, social exclusion, migration, stigma, climate change, sexuality, and gender studies. SPICI has maintained a team at the United Nations since the late 1980s and is accredited by the Economic and Social Council and Department of Global Communications. Just a few logistical points before we get started. On your screen, you should be able to see and hear from all of our panelists in view and listen only mode. That being said, we would love to hear from you. So if you have questions or comments to share, please enter them in the chat and send them to both panelists and attendees so that everyone can see the questions coming in. I'd also like to mention that today's event is being recorded. And so we'll be posting it to SPICI's YouTube page at youtube.com backslash SPSSI. The recording will be posted later today so that anyone who misses the event or would like to return to something presented today can watch it at a later time. Now to our main event. We have five fantastic panelists who will be speaking today on addressing the gaps in the holistic health needs of diverse youth populations across the world, which have been exasperated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Their talks will also highlight the importance of empathy in building effective responses to the COVID-19 crisis and towards the attainment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Each talk will be 15 minutes, followed by a brief 10-minute discussion. So I'll begin by, we'll begin by hearing, hearing from Philip. Sorry, I just practiced this. Philip Cadal. Philip is a doctoral candidate at the University of Mannheim in Germany, and he also holds a master's in psychology. He does research on the interrelations of human and environmental health, pro-environmental health behaviors such as meat reduction, and the unique role of social media in promoting these behaviors. His talk is titled, The Planet's Health and Our Health Are One, Let Us Promote It. Philip, if you'd like to share your screen, we can get started. Thank you so much, I will certainly do so. I hope that now you should be able to see my, my slides, yeah? Perfect. Well, I'm very happy to be here today with all of you, at least virtually, and exchange our ideas about how we can recalibrate and rethink a sustainable future after this pandemic. Uh, as Trisha already said, I'm a doctoral candidate in health psychology, uh, so I can keep that part short. Um, and uh, I'm also active in the European Health Psychology Society and the Psychology Coalition at the United Nations. This year's ECOSOC Youth Forum, of which this is a site event, takes place or starts on World Health Day. And as we think about building back better, I think that health certainly needs to be at the center of our attention. And today I will try to emphasize why we need to think health more holistically in this approach to rethink and recalibrate our future. The COVID-19 pandemic that is still going on has dominated the past year and until now it has cost over 2.5 million lives. While we still don't know the origin of SARS-CoV-2 for certain, it is believed to have developed in animals and transmitted to humans. And that is something that is not uncommon. 60% of all human pathogens develop in animals and then transmit to humans. Importantly, such zoonotic diseases are getting more frequent as climate changes and environmental destruction continues. And so does the number of deaths related to heats and floods. In a very dramatic way, these developments show us that our health as humans is very much intertwined with the health of other animals and also the environment that we all share. To build back better in a more resilient way and to ensure the health of us as humans, but also other life forms on this planet, we need to take a holistic approach to this topic. And this is very much catch up in the concept of One Health. It is an integrated and transdisciplinary approach 
that recognizes the fundamental relationship between the health of animals, people, plants, and the environment. And it aims to ensure that specialists in multiple sectors work together to tackle health threats. And I think psychology can certainly be one of these disciplines that contributes in tackling these threats. Importantly, One Health is also very much an issue of global equity. Neither the negative effects of climate change and environmental degradation on health, nor the contributions to climate change and environmental degradation themselves are distributed equally across the globe. While in the US, the consumption of an average person accounts for almost 18 tons of CO2 emissions per year, in Europe, only eight tons are accounted for by individual consumption. And in India, for example, it's only 1.7 tons. Philip, the, I'm, I'm sorry for inter, uh, uh, interrupting you. You're sure. in uh, the speaker view, and so we can actually see your notes in your next slide. Oh, then um, that's that's the wrong mode of sharing. I'm really sorry for that. That's okay. Let me change that. <laughs> sorry, I don't don't want to. No, thank you very much. Thought. So now yep. you can only see the the slides. Yes, that's good. Perfect. Um, all right. Then let's go back to where we were. The, the issue of global health that is captured in the concept of One Health. Um, as I said, neither the negative consequences nor the contributions to climate change are, con uh, are distributed equally. And uh, the 1% of people with the highest income globally are responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions combined than the 50% of persons earning the least. Yet the poorer regions and people are disproportionately impacted by the negative effects of climate change. The WHO and also the UN acknowledge the importance of this holistic approach to, to health. And in, uh, in a recent paper, they emphasized as one step necessary in the response to COVID-19 Uh, is to protect and preserve nature as a source of human health and to promote healthy and sustainable food systems. When we look at the uh, sustainable development goals, some of those are related to one health. Importantly, while the singular goals addressing health and climate change are separately, goal 70 highlights the interconnectedness of all the goals. And uh, in promoting and moving forward this agenda, we certainly need to take this interconnectedness into account. Why should we as psychologists take a look at this? Human behavior is key in promoting One Health. In the paper I recently contributed to, we conceptualized the behaviors relevant as mitigation behaviors, aiming at uh, reducing the negative effects that humans have on the environment and adaption behaviors that aim to reduce the negative effects of climate change and environmental degradation on human health. Uh, importantly, mitigation behaviors indirectly also benefit human health through improved air quality and water quality, for example. And these behaviors include, for example, recycling or avoiding air travel and the use of pesticides, but also the adoption of sustainable innovation and products. Adaption behaviors include, uh, for example, mask wearing in uh, areas with poor air quality, or also structural changes to proof buildings and cities against, uh, against floods or severe storms. Importantly, uh, while some might contribute most by focusing on mitigation behaviors, for others, adaption might be most important. Uh, as I said, the effects and also the contributions to climate change are not equally contributed. Some behaviors actually have the potential to benefit all dimensions of One Health at the same time. These include, for example, reduced meat consumption. We know that high levels of meat consumption are associated with risk of coronary heart disease, but also cancer, diabetes, stroke, and overall mortality. So reducing it certainly comes with health benefits. But on the other side, it also has positive effects on the environment. Reducing uh, meat consumption could lower our levels of greenhouse gas emissions and also lower our need for resources like land and water. Another behavior would be active mobility. We can increase our levels of physical activity, which is beneficial for individual health, but it can also contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So in my opinion, I think these behaviors should receive special attention when we think about promoting One Health. As I said, 
Psychology, in my opinion, has a lot to contribute here. We are a discipline that is concerned with explaining, predicting, and also changing behavior. And we have developed theories, but also contexts to better understand how we can achieve behavior change, but also maintain it. Uh, and some of these models or concepts are specifically meant for practitioners and policymakers, like, for example, the behavior change wheel. It is a synthesis of 19 behavior change frameworks that draw on a wide range of disciplines and approaches. And this knowledge that we have gathered, gathered about behavior change and uh, the maintenance of it can certainly be applied to behaviors that are relevant for the promotion of one health. Additionally, uh, psychological theories also, or some psychological theories suggest that we should distinguish between people who are already motivated to act in a certain way and those net not yet motivated. And we should take this into account when we develop interventions. These should be tailored accordingly. For example, for people that are not yet motivated, interventions might focus on aiming to create behavioral intentions, while those already motivated might be best supported by volitional intervention techniques that help them actually put their motivation to, to action. Psychological distance as the felt uh, distance of, uh, of developments, and in this case, climate change consequences, has been shown to be an important barrier for pro-environmental behaviors. If I feel that the melting of glaciers and the loss of biodiversity is something that is happening far away, it might feel not so relevant for my own behavior and might not lead me to the decision to actually change my behaviors. Some behaviors, as I said, like meat-reduced diets or active mobility also have health consequences, and these might feel more proximal to some and thus be more motivating. So uh, interventions might uh, look at lowering psychological distance. And in other contexts, we've already seen that this can lead to an increased support for pro-environmental policies. Another barrier, and there I come a bit to the research I'm conducting myself, is deliberate ignorance. It denotes the conscious choice not to seek or use knowledge and information, and it can serve functions like emotion regulation. And in two studies, we found that in the context of meat consumption, we see that this can be a barrier for uh, information interventions. We see that a higher meat consumption predicts higher levels of deliberate ignorance towards negative effects of meat consumption, and we also see that higher levels of deliberate ignorance reduce the effects that this information have on the change in attitudes and intentions. And this is something that information interventions certainly should consider. I cannot say that we should force everyone to see all of the information. People certainly might also have a right to remain ignorant about certain issues. But as people who develop interventions, we should consider it at least in designing these interventions. There, are, there is a wide array of additional concepts that can play a role here. For example, the perception of risk. Am I, uh, do I have the feeling that I might be affected, negatively affected by certain developments? Um, do I feel that I have something to win or lose from exhibiting a certain behavior? Self-efficacy, do I even have the feeling that I'm able uh, or am I confident that I can change or, uh, or show a certain behavior? How does my uh, social sphere act and how do they expect me to act? How are the social norms that I'm experiencing? And also, do we feel as a community in tackling the environmental and health related issues that we are facing? And not only do we feel as a group, but also do we have the feeling that we are able to address them? Do we, are able, do we feel that we are able to change something for the better? Importantly, we as humans don't act in a, in a vacuum and the environment always plays an important role for our behavior. And we know that changing the environment in a way that makes behaviors beneficial for one health easier and more convenient can be an effective way of promoting it. So to come to the conclusion of my talk and the implications that I draw from this, I think that in order to promote one health, we need to first of all acknowledge that there is a deep interconnectedness of our own health with the health of the planet and all its life forms. Additionally, we need to tailor our interventions to different target groups to promote One Health in the most efficient way. 
This can mean that we need to see for whom mitigation behaviors might be at the core of one health promotions and for whom adaption behaviors might be most important, but also, for example, to look at those already motivated and those not motivated yet. We should definitely utilize our psychological knowledge when developing and uh, designing policies and practices. And we should contribute this to policymakers and practitioners. We should also diminish the psychological distance of climate change consequences. We can uh, do this by using effective narratives and communication strategies. And I think we also need to strive to develop a shared identity and a collective efficacy in achieving One Health. These recommendations are partially based on a statement of the Psychology Coalition at the United Nations that we published basically today and uh, tomorrow in commemoration of World Health Day. And it is also co-sponsored by, by SPICI, so the organization uh, that is our host today. I will um, post the link into the statement in the, in the chat. So if anyone is interested in that, uh, feel free to read up on that. And other than that, I definitely can say that events like this very much make me hopeful that we will be able to move forward in this direction of fostering One Health. Uh, thanks to all the organizers, especially also to Priya. And I look forward to all following talks and to discussion. And uh, I want to close on a quote by Henry David Thoreau, who said, nature is but another name for health. I think the planet's health really is our health and to ensure our well-being, we need to protect it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. I really appreciate you highlighting the interconnectedness of the health of humans with the planet. Um, and I look forward to reading the statement um, that you'll be posting that's busy sponsored. Um, I also just wanted to say I appreciated your attention to uh, lessening the distance that people feel between themselves and their environment uh, and, and focusing on intervention, um, different adventure, intervention approaches for those who are already motivated compared, motivated compared to those who aren't. Um, so next we'll be hearing from Dr. C.V. Um, Mathi Lalagun, who is the founder and director of the youth-led nonprofit Trust for Youth and Child Leadership International based in India and the US. He serves as um, a representative to the United Nations and is an independent global social work researcher and development consultant. Um, he's also the associate director of strategies and impact at the SAFE Lab at Columbia University. And he's a master's and PhD in social work specialized in child-centered community development. Today, he's going to be talking to us about youth-led community action for holistic well-being, um, lessons from SWAT. Siva, take it away. Okay. Thank you, uh, Trishan, and uh, thanks to Priya for um, inviting me here today. And very happy to be part of this Ecosoc Youth Forum side event. Um, so yes, today I want to discuss about um, Youth-led community day, community action for holistic well-being. Lessons from uh, one of our project called uh, Inahi, which means uh, youth with the urban and rural communities. So that's a very uh, unique uh, approach we have used. Uh, how we can balance between um, the emerging technologies and indigenous knowledges for a holistic well-being of community. If you want to develop a community, how we can bring the young people and their knowledge and strategies and technologies and the indigenous knowledge from the uh, community, particularly mostly we work with uh, indigenous communities uh, in India. So there's like a lot of indigenous knowledge and then young people are access to a lot of uh, modern technology and emerging technologies. So how we can integrate and then build a, a new uh, ways and approach for um, holistic well-being or like even uh, holistic well-being of the communities using a visual SWAT. So yes, myself, uh, Shiva Madhyagan, I'm from India and the US, and I'm a founder director of Trust for Youth and Child Leadership, as well as I serve as a associate director. So I would like to give a brief intro about the organization I work with. So TYCL is a transnational uh, youth-led organization based in uh, India and the US. And uh, its focus is on a uh, couple of uh, core areas, principles, and approaches. 
It's very youth-led and child-centric organization, promoting uh, safe, inclusive, and participatory youth-led actions, and uh, holistic approach as part of our uh, uh, interventions. And uh, anything we do, we want to have like a more of a child-centric uh, community development model. That's why it's it's very unique approaches. We kind of uh, uh, have a lot more ex uh, community-based uh, intervention and experimentations. At the same time, a lot more challenges in doing so. So uh, with that context, uh, you know, like the TYCL has experimented some of the holistic uh, models working with the communities. So I'll share a bit. And uh, the one project uh, which recently we adopted uh, for uh, very specifically for girls is uh, Girls Lead Girls, a holistic self-defense uh, uh, curriculum for um, girls and young women in India. So this, when we say holistic, uh, there's a, like a lot more component of like how we take care of the socio-cultural and socio-legal, the economic and emotional, sexual, online, physical, and uh, intellectual. And the more important aspect is like anything you do, you need to have like this environmental consciousness within the every process of the actions you do. So it's integrated approach. Uh, so this particular uh, self-defense uh, model, we, I'm just sharing this because like, I would like to have like, you know, how our holistic model is integrated with the program for girls and the program for children. We also developed a program for holistic child development indicators. When we are giving um, holistic um, learning approaches and mentorship to the children, like how we can integrate the holistic approach within their own um, learning um, skills. So with that, the more important aspect of what we have used on a visual SWAT, uh, I'm having some trouble with this. Uh, is it? Okay, hold on, just a sec. I'm just trying to make the videos as accessible as possible. So this, this particular project is uh, Inaki. Uh, youth with urban and rural areas. It's normally we any kind of uh, SWOT analysis. Normally we do for a community <clears throat> business development approach. If there is any specific issues we want to address it, uh, we use the approach of uh, um, SWOT analysis and to identify the strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. But uh, if you're going to do a visual like the SWOT analysis with the communities, how that would look like. And the organization uh, TYCL is very much driven by the participatory action research model. But if you want to use a participatory action research by the indigenous communities and most of the community members are uh, very uh, limited education and having a very limited access to the uh, <clears throat> uh, technology tools. So how we can do that? That's where like we bring the youth into the uh, place, the local local youth from the urban areas and going to the indigenous communities and partner with the local youth and indigenous communities and teach them like uh, the, the uh, technology and media skills and the capturing the use some of the like, you know, we use a transact walk and uh, trying to do a, a SWOT analysis on the paper with the youth and uh, asking the communities and like uh, visually capture the SWOT analysis and project back. So this is the process we follow on this. Like if, even a, any, any uh, visual SWAT model, we want to do it with the youth. The first thing we do is like identification of villages. We go to like one of the most uh, maybe underdeveloped are uh, uh, the villages who do not have uh, enough uh, services. Uh, there, already there is like a plenty of uh, 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 socio-economic and cultural issues are existing. So we pick that those communities and uh, go for a village walk to identify the, the youth in the local community. And then it's done by the, uh, the local youth and collect the basic uh, uh, data about the community who are all there, like what is happening in the community and then do a SWOT analysis, SWOT analysis on the paper with the people by the local young people. And uh, once we do that, we get a kind of a clarity on like what exactly the communities uh, are about. 
and what is their strength, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats. Then we set up a village youth action group. That youth action groups helps us to uh, uh, do the like uh, visual SWAT and do like take the camera and then go and capture the whatever the strength they have said like a capture from the across the uh, intergenerational groups in the community like uh, children, youth, uh, community leaders, community members and bring everyone into the picture and then capture entire uh, SWAT analysis and have a community reflections. And uh, we once like we, we when we think of uh, uh, getting a community reflections, we, we project the pre-screening happens to the community and then they, they see what they have uh, see as a problem, weaknesses, their own strength. Any community we visit, like we always say, like the community has their own potentials and their own skills, their own strength and how we can um, use those strength and we strength and opportunities to develop a, uh, their own community. Often like when, when we work with the community, people always say that they are poor and they don't know anything. And then we are the saviors who's going to change the entire community. It's not, they have like a lot more resources internally and then a lot more knowledge to share with us. We learn a, quite a lot from the community. So we screen them and once the pre-screening is over, we call the stakeholders. So when we call the stakeholders, for example, like we, we, we used a one community called Adian community, where this community is predominantly engaged in the begging. And there was no land. They were like a living in the settlement. And there was no ID, uh, any of the ID card or any kind of social status. They've been having these challenges. So when we started doing this visual SWAT with this particular community, we identified there's a lot more uh, strength in this particular community, there's a lot more opportunities where we, that can be developed and establish a much more uh, stable and sustainable community uh, for community and family living opportunities for this, this children and youth in the community. So we wanted to do the SWOT analysis and we uh, try to do that and uh, with the stakeholders. Once we, everything, all the SWOT, they visually captured, we bring the stakeholders from the community. The stakeholders are like uh, the, the government authorities and private agencies and political parties and the school teachers and the healthcare service providers as a, the local police stations. So whoever possibly can be engaged with the community, everybody will be there to hear the people's voice directly from the people. And uh, once they hear, hear about it, like then they have like to know that what is their responsibility, what they have been missing to do this, with this community. Once um, that's happening, then they one like thing we get is like community members get a lot more clarity about what is their own strength. Particularly with this community, we identify that like uh, the 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 way we have been like uh, talking about the gender uh, justice as a global issue, gender inequality. But that particular community, though there is like no uh, basic communities, but uh, they treat each other very equal at the family level, at the community level, both voices are heard quite well and uh, very uh, focused on the family life. Uh, and there's a care and love for one another and uh, they, they respect the community living and uh, people are willing to work hard. So this is like a very strong strength. And then we identify the weaknesses of like a people are, uh, uh, alcoholism is quite prevalent in the community. There's no habit of saving. They don't think of like what need to be saved, lack of awareness, limited skills. They have like very specific uh, traditional occupations, but they're not thinking about like what are the other alternate opportunities, livelihood opportunities that are available for them. And uh, they have, do have some traditional beliefs and harmful practices. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, government schemes are available, but they are not aware of it as an opportunity. NGOs and medias are willing to support them. And uh, the caste-based discrimination is one of the major threat and no documentation, lack of access to government system and services because they're, they're mostly indigenous people. They always have a, like a social fear that how they can go and access. So when you look at the whole uh, SWAT analysis, we look at in a child in the center and then family and community, this is how this multi-layer approach, 
everybody have that um, aspiration that like uh, they want to ensure a best uh, to their children and they don't want that uh, next generation to be suffered as they have been suffering so when we capture the children in the uh, child centric approach they are like a more interested in engaging with the community development initiatives so we take that as an like a great opportunity to work with this community so when we do all this and uh, when the community members are coming we can cultivate the collective power to overcome the generational fear and uh, identity and respect is forming and then even the kids are able to identify their own uh, the family how the family identity is important to them and uh, sense of ownership and there's a ray of uh, hope for a future there's all like a emerging within the community and uh, with particularly this community what we can accomplish uh, as overall in within last two years there was no child marriage reported after the visual swat and uh, no child beggars um, and uh, they got like their id cards ration card and food stamps which is available within the government they've been struggling for last 15 years and uh, the land rights the government has allocated a specific uh, piece of land for each family now they have their own piece of land and we help them to build a house with a half and half uh, contribution the, the each family contributed half of their money and then we as organization contributed half and we built a structure and kids are enrolled in the school now they can like there's a permanent settlement them there's an address for them to enroll in the school and uh, the alternate livelihood opportunities for the adult members and more importantly access to water electricity and the sanitation facilities and the healthcare facilities were like a set it up it's it's not like everything has been done by uh, done by the tycr it was it was completely uh, done by the uh, done by the stakeholders uh, who are uh, part of this uh, community and uh, we thought that like it's a very positive approach something which will be uh, model can be uh, implemented elsewhere and we are also like uh, expanding this approach and model to a different uh, uh, places but there are like some of the challenges as a youth led organizations we been encountering on as uh, resource and time constraints it's a, like a long term process young any young people are going and working they want to have an instant outcome within the community but it won't happen like that we need to have like a slow and uh, work with the communities and a step by step process and uh, there's a lot of political uh, parties engagements they don't want uh, any other young people to come and capture because they've been using them as a uh, the campaigners for their elections the any one they want to mobilize the crowd they take them pay the less money and then take them to their political meetings but now people are don't want to go to the political meetings so there's a, like a lot of threat from the political engagements and you need a lot of interdisciplinary skills we used uh, multimedia um, skills and we used the uh, like technologies and uh, also we used the participatory action research and the swat analysis you need like a lot more management skills and the public relations there's like a multi disciplinary skills it's required to work with the communities so these are like some of the lessons we uh, because uh, we learned from this and uh, we are trying to overcome uh, these gaps well in advance in the uh, upcoming uh, visual swats with other communities so this is my last one and uh, if the uh, decision makers and uh, policy makers believe in youth led uh, community development uh, the, with the proper resource allocations they uh, ensuring the uh, co creating the self sustainability within the communities are maybe reality sometimes soon and we are work, keep working with this kind of uh, the voiceless communities and uh, the well, the communities are coming up uh, with a much more louder voices and they are they are their own voices they we don't need like a external people to preach them what they need to say for their own development the visual swats enables them to amplify their own voices for their own development that's what we believe in as a self sustained communities can be ensured if you have, if you adopt this approach
Thank you. And uh, we strongly believe that local actions can bring the global change, be the change. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Siva. I think it's really powerful to think about designing, not only designing interventions, but I think rethinking current interventions that can take this bottom-up approach um, to not only empower the local community, um, but especially youth. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Priya Darshni Sandanapache. Priya is a research associate at Rutgers University and holds a master's in clinical and counseling psychology. Her studies examine different components involved in the context of HIV AIDS, such as mental health, substance abuse, um, biomedical prevention and mobile health with an emphasis on the social determinants of health and health disparities reduction. Priya is a SPICI UN NGO intern and she organized this event today. Um, she also serves as a UN uh, DGC civil society youth representative um, on the steering committee and her talk is titled here and now mindfulness and sustainable future. Thank you Tisha for that. Um, hi everyone. Um, I really hope that you all are enjoying this panel discussion today as I am and let's start. Hello again. Um, I really wish uh, I'm able to see all today, uh, especially when the timer went off. Uh, how many of you looked away from the screen or just like took the phone randomly and checked for a text or a call or just even thought about what you're going to have for lunch or what you're going to do after this event or just simply stared at the, at the screen and focused on the timer. I think this answer is going to help us understand what my topic is about today, which is mindfulness. So we are living in the middle of a pandemic and youth specifically are disproportionately affected by this COVID-19 through social isolation or whether in changes in their daily routines or even interruptions in their jobs and education. We are seeing an increasing um, in anxiety or depression related disorders, alcohol and substance use, sleep issues, PTSD symptoms, and even suicidal thoughts. Uh, is all of these are kind of like a new trend? Definitely the answer is no, because COVID-19 is just an addition to one of many global challenges that youth are facing right now from global climate change or whether it's systemic racism or oppression or whether it's migration or poverty, the list just goes on. So how do we exactly address this mental health crisis? Because mental health is a key determinant of improving well-being and the quality of life in general. But unfortunately, mental health always takes a backseat in every conversation that we have. Because when we are looking into an effective pathway to resilience and recovery, we cannot fulfill this, uh, this achievement unless we take a holistic approach that incorporates mental well-being as a sustainable future. So that's why here we are gonna focus on uh, mindfulness, which is one of the evidence-based strategies to improve well-being of an individual and community at large. So my first introduction um, to this particular topic came in when I was doing my clinical practice. So just before we start the internship, we had to do this um, role plays with our peers to kind of get comfortable with the setting as well as to improve our approach towards the client. So one of the main criticisms that I always had when I go into the session is that, okay, how am I supposed to help the client? So I'm very solution focused so that while I'm listening to the client in the back of my mind, I have so many questions from, okay, what type of a question I should ask? Am I using all the counseling skills that I've studied so far? Or how do I handle the situation? So the just list goes on. And you could see this is kind of kind of um, generalized in the normal daily routine that we all have. We will be doing something, but then we'll be thinking something else at the same time. So that was the um, experience that kind of taught me how important it is to be just to be present with the client 
at that moment. And that itself is a huge healing process. And you see here is a picture of a water drop, which is basically the symbol of mindfulness that represent time and space. So the vertical fog is the time that is um, talks about the current, past and future, as well as the horizontal form is the space. So which basically to denote that you have to be in the center, not in the past or not in the future. The mindfulness has three key components that is being present, being aware and being non-judgmental. We are living in a fast paced life. Uh, we are just good at becoming multitasking. Uh, for most of you, that 30 second timer would have been very awkward, like because we are not used to the silence. We are always doing something. We cannot just sit and just do nothing because we are not, our brain is not functioning in that way. That's why it's very important just to focus on your present, not to worry about the past or future, just focus here and now. Then coming to the awareness, awareness to one's thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensation. This kind of reminds me of the time that I am having bad cold. I think that will be the only time I miss breathing. I mean, when I have a stuffy nose, like I kind of reminisce over the time that I was able to breathe through my nose. I mean, it's happening right now, but then we don't put much attention to that. And that's why it's important to kind of like relax and listen to what our body has to say or um, what mind thinking. And then coming to the non-judgmental part, it's just accepting our experiences as it is, not as a saying whether it's good or bad. All the mindfulness um, came from a Buddhist philosophy. There are a lot of um, studies that have focused on the mechanism and benefits of mindfulness, specifically in the humanities field. So here you see a list of uh, benefits that have proven um, from decreasing stress and anxiety, develop self-control, increase attention span, foster compassion and empathy, promoting resilience, improving social and emotional skills, and enhance creativity. I would like to go a little bit deeper on the empathy aspect as we are in the panel focusing on the importance of empathy in a sustainable uh, development. So why is that? Because for a sustainable future, not um, just looking after us is not enough. We have to look after the people around us, whether it's life below water or life on land, every entities have to meet their own needs to us to achieve a sustainable development. So the research shows that people who score high on mindfulness also tend to report higher level of empathy. Um, they kind of uh, describe this mechanism in different ways. So one is decentering. When you become aware of your own emotions in a non-judgmental way, you kind of take an objective point of view of your thoughts. So you're basically disidentifying yourself and taking an objective perspective of what you're thinking or what you're feeling. And another approach is that when you're aware of your own emotions, you basically uh, have a better understanding of how emotion is working or emotional process in general. That really helps you to relate to another person or relate to an, how another person is feeling in a particular situation. So that brings us to uh, our main question that how mindfulness is connected to sustainability. So one of the, um, the thing to be noted is the main, a uh, lot of mindfulness studies are focused in a climate change context. As folks uh, talked in these um, studies, there are a lot of uh, uh, studies that talk about mindfulness, how that increases pro-social behaviors or rather pro-environmental behaviors due to its emphasis on the connection between body, mind, and nature. So here it's a very recent review done by Thiemann and Sheet which was actually published in 2021, they did an analysis of 30 years of research between mindfulness and sustainability and came up with six major uh, theoretical links. So that is heightened awareness, improved personal health and subjective well-being, high level of connectedness with nature, stronger across social behaviors, stronger intrinsic values and ethical decision-making and open to, to new experience. So we have all these findings, so, but, the major responsibility that we have is how do we translate these findings into action from policy level to individual level? So rather than I'm giving out a recommendation, I would like to point out some examples how, how it's been implemented at each of the level. So first, moving on to the policy level. So the Mindfulness Initiative, which is, was an interesting program that came out of after the attempt of teaching mindfulness 
to politicians in the UK government. They had a very promising outcomes, even from the way they looked at social issues, not just from an economical perspective, but from a humanitarian perspective where they would be able to connect their mind and heart to these social issues. That also had a greater impact on their policy crafting and even the way they handled critical issues and political discourse. And what's inspiring is that because of these promising outcomes, they were able to also collaborate with 45 plus other countries to bring this initiative in these governments from Australia, Canada, Germany, and even in Sri Lanka. Second one, we are moving on to the organizational level. Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute, which was originally developed in Google using the mindfulness technique, emotional intelligence, and leadership tool to unlock the potential of an individual to work productively at work or even just to optimize their functioning in life. They've also partnered with a lot of other organizations from United Nations to Ford and LinkedIn to kind of adopt this program in these organizations as well. And you can see they've also shown to increase improve overall well-being, resilience building to increasing focus and attention. Then we are moving on to the community perspective, which uh, we are taking on an educational point of view. So there are a number of different uh, curriculums that have integrated the mindfulness techniques specifically in the school setting. So Mindful School is one of the nonprofit organizations that is committed to improve the social emotional well-being in school communities. So they basically provide the mindfulness um, trainings to educators and students and also make it accessible to the communities in need. And they improve uh, emotional regulation, focus, greater compassion and engagement in students and educators as well. Last but not least, you, the individual levels. I personally believe, and this is the, the most challenging level out of everything because these individual choices that we make, make a greater impact when we are thinking about a sustainable living. Uh, one of the feedback that we always get, including myself for a long time, I used to say, oh, this is not my thing. Uh, I can't just spend a 15 minutes of time in my busy schedule to do meditation or to you do yoga. And, but the thing is with mindfulness, this is something that you can do in, in your daily routines. You can incorporate in the things that you do. For an instance, eating, mindful eating, or if you go for a walk, uh, just kind of absorbing your surroundings, listening to the sounds of the bird, just kind of looking at the nature, or even listening to music, rather passive listening, just putting the headphone and just kind of like texting in the phone, you could just focus on the music to the instruments that they have played or the tones, the rhythms, you could focus on that. And these little changes can really have a greater impact when we are thinking of conscious living for a sustainable future. So these are very few examples that I took it and how they have integrated the mindfulness in each of these levels, but if the question is whether are these uh, kind of enough for us to kind of achieving a 2030 agenda, the answer is definitely no. Specifically, we are um, considering the pandemic era, we are seeing a rising number of mental health challenges and we need more focus on the mental well-being and how do we incorporate such techniques that in, uh, improve the well-being in general. So we need more investment in research and funding uh, that can focus on how to incorporate this mindfulness in different arenas. And you can also see it in a different way, investing yourself in um, incorporating mindfulness in your daily routine. That also makes a bigger change. So this investment is of no use when we don't integrate and implement this, uh, these uh, curriculums or these programs in the practical world because it's of no use, the research just being on the paper, but it's also be translated in the community level. So therefore invest, integrate and implement. I really hope you benefited from this presentation. So let's be mindful, not mindful. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Um, I really liked your points about how we can think about mindfulness at these different levels at policy, organizational and community, in addition to the self and when visualizing and thinking about the ways that mindfulness impacts a community um, when these when these actions are taken at different structural levels. Um, so our next speaker is Mohsen Mohudin. Uh, he is an activist 
artist and founder and CEO of MeWe International, which leverages the science of storytelling and communications as tools for healing, resilience, and community building. MeWe International's programs have supported more than 5,000 youth and caregivers across over 12 countries. And Mosin has over eight years of experience working in human rights, global digital communications, and youth issues centered on global development. His talk is titled Communication, a Pillar for Both Human Rights and Health. Mosin, you can take it away. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the previous speakers. I've been taking loads of notes, uh, so I appreciate y'all. I'm not going to show any slides today. I'm just going to talk to you, so you're going to have to see this ugly face for the next 15 minutes. Um, uh, I'm honored to be here uh, just to to frame up things. I am not a scientist. Um, I'm not a researcher. Um, I haven't gotten formal education in psychology or neuroscience, but I am a survivor of sexual abuse. I'm a survivor of violence from war. I am a survivor of domestic abuse and violence in the home. And uh, everything that I'm speaking about comes from personal individual experience, but uh, over a decade of experience working with brothers and sisters uh, in some of the most underrepresented, marginalized, invisible places on earth. Um, so as someone that is not a researcher or a scientist, but that has lived experience with these issues, uh, to be able to connect with people that actually are studying this for a long time, uh, it's always a, an honor and a pleasure. So thanks for hearing me out as a non-scientist. Um, so the first thing I wanna frame up is <clears throat> the virus, trauma, rising inequality and social injustice have something in common. All of these threats to individual and communal well-being and security and peace um, all of these threats attack and weaponize one thing, which is omnipresent and all, across all cultures, which is communication. The virus is completely uh, threatening and reshaping how our human species interacts, how we interact with one another, um, how we learn, how we educate, how we take in perspectives, how we look up information. The virus is completely reshaping how our human species communicates and uses communication. Trauma, at a physiological, psychological level, you guys know better than me, uh, completely reshapes the brain and how the brain talks to the body. Again, affecting the story that the brain is telling the body. So trauma also affects communication. And then of course, there's inequality and injustice. Um, these things also, uh, at a community level, arrest the development of an, of an entire of entire groups of people. Um, there is a huge need right now in the world to approach communication skills building and narrative interventions as not just a human right, but as a pillar of health. These things are often treated differently storytelling, narrative interventions, communication skills building, they're often looked at from a human rights lens or a nice to have or a cute thing to have, but these are pillars of health. Um, and if you look at increasing evidence from the neuroscience community, from the psychology community, um, narrative therapies, logo therapies, uh, being able to write about your traumas, being able to uh, have communities where you can express yourself and build pro-social relationships has immense effects, not just on a psychological level, but on a physical level as well. So a lot of what I'm talking about today comes from this experience that I have of leading MeWe International. Um, MeWe International is uh, an international nonprofit that designs and deploys communication skills building tools and trainings where narrative interventions, storytelling interventions are coupled with neuroeducation uh, basic mental health, psychosocial support education, and the process of communication skills building I've seen in the 10 years of doing this work in Syria, 
um, Lebanon, Mexico, Honduras, the United States, Tajikistan, wherever we've been, Iraq, communication skills building, when harnessed in the right way, when coupled with um, goal setting, when coupled with perspective taking, when coupled with emotion regulation and neuroeducation, communication skills building can enhance psychological well-being. It can enhance agency and leadership skills. And, and at a third level, communication skills building can improve community engagement. So a lot of the work and what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is syncing um, healing, agency, and representation. And the representation piece is really important. Um, representing yourself and having the tools to represent yourself, to identify your emotional states, to regulate your emotions, to identify the perspectives uh, and feelings and emotions of others, and being able to represent all those things yourself for yourself is incredibly important for one's self-esteem. It's incredibly important for um, your own well-being. It's incredibly important for you to be able to frame and reconnect with the goals that you have every day or that you have in the next five to 10 years. Um, representation is healing, um, which again goes back to my point about communications being both a human right and a pillar of health. Um, 60 to 70,000 years ago, uh, Homo erectus introduced language to the world. Um, and the core of language and communication came from symbols, sounds, and senses. Uh, communication came from interoceptive awareness, awareness of the sensations of your body. That's how communication started. And from that interoceptive awareness and uh, uh, symbols, we started giving words and meanings to these symbols. And from giving words and meanings to these symbols, uh, communication was able to reclaim control in some ways of what biology and the external world was doing to us as a species. Um, and uh, that was a beautiful thing. But what ended up happening was, is that those that could best communicate and harness the power of language ended up weaponizing this power and subjugating so many others people and limiting access for being able to understand how powerful communications is has and the have nots and this is where we are today um i wanted to take this opportunity speaking to you wonderful researchers and psychologists that to understand that and to challenge you again i'm on the other i'm on the other side of things inequality lives in language Inequality lives in language. That includes the books that you're reading, how you're learning about psychology, how you're learning about neuroscience. There is inequality, in it, meaning that this is information that should be accessed by everybody. Everybody should be able to understand how their brain talks to their body. Everybody should be able to understand in Bessel van der Kolk's work, right? Your body keeps score. What does that mean? Everybody should be taught these things. But in certain cultures, for example, in the Syrian refugee camps where we work or in Honduras or in Mexico, this, these concepts are coming from one part of the world, from privileged parts of the world. And there's no relevance or cultural sensitivity or context for how it can be utilized by human beings that live outside of these spaces. I would even challenge the whole concept of the SDGs and how we name these things is completely irrelevant to a lot of people that are living in these marginalized, underrepresented, invisible communities. Inequality lives in language and it's something that we're all programmed with. And I just wanted to challenge all of us to think about that, just to be aware of it. Um, and this leads to my, my next point about the work that we do. Um, we've reached actually more than 7,000 people and I haven't reached those 7,000 people with MIWI International why we've reached those 7,000 people and why we're seeing that storytelling, communication, skills building interventions are enhancing people's perspective taking, emotion regulation and goal setting capabilities is because we're training community members from these communities who are Syrian, who are Mexican and survivors of cartel violence and domestic abuse, who are youth who have survived cartel violence in Honduras, who are incarcerated Black and African-American youth in DC. They are leading the program to each other. 
we all know the benefits of narrative interventions, logotherapy, narrative therapy, uh, especially when coupled with other, you know, uh, clinical type of support, how narrative and communication skills building can really improve symptoms related to PTSD, depression, anxiety. But we have to think beyond what we know and think about who's doing it. Who is doing it? So for example, on the border of Syria where we operate in several women's shelters, people aren't showing up to the women's shelter. They're not gonna show up to something that is labeled mental health or self-care or psychology. These women are not gonna show up to those programs. We, I'm telling you, because that's what they're telling me. I'm not making this up. But when you have Syrian women, whether they're illiterate, whether they finish school or not, whether they're a single mother, a widow, it doesn't matter their context. And you give them access to this information and then you have trainings and tools that help them lead it peer to peer. Then these women, more women from the community start showing up to that women's shelter because it's someone that they know who has access to this information that's been trained on how to facilitate it. So I guess one of my main learning points to you guys is not just the theories and understanding the science behind things, but going a step further about how can you create ways for people, survivors to facilitate these things, to train it. We see, and we know that one of the most impactful parts of our program is the neuroeducation component, understanding the systems of the brain, what happens to your brain under chronic stress. And we've developed tools in multiple languages over 10 years that the community has helped us reframe and, and contextualize. And it's one of the most highly referenced parts of our program that is uh, that people say has helped them a lot for regulating their own emotions and being able to take in other people's perspectives. And it's not just the information, it's who's facilitating it, who's communicating it. Right, so if it's from Syrian widow to other Syrian widows, there's something incredibly beautiful and powerful that happens from that process, right? Um, so, you know, a big part of the work that we're learning is not just the information, but who's doing it and actually building tools, facilitation tools for the information that can be community led and community owned. Uh, so the way that we're working with MeWe Syria, for instance, in Jordan, Turkey and Lebanon and Iraq and other places, is uh, after two to three years of trainings and where they're spreading the program peer to peer, the, the Syrian refugees are owning the program. They own the IP, the tools, everything. Uh, same in Mexico, Miwi Mexico, Miwi Honduras, all these other places that we are. Um, so having community ownership models in place, I think is extremely important. Again, not just from a human rights lens, but from a health lens. When you see these communities and these women and survivors, for instance, leave, their self-esteem goes up. The self-esteem of the youth who have models in the community that they can see in front of them leading this information, leading these movements, I think has huge benefits for the, the psychology of the community. Um, one last thing, a few things I wanna say is uh, there's, there's something I want us to all keep in mind. An arrested narrative, and this is something I believe and we have in MeWe International, an arrested narrative of yourself as an individual can and does translate to an arrested development of your entire community. An arrested narrative of yourself will translate to an arrested development of your entire community. And when it comes to the SDGs, I think there's a complete blind spot to this fact. And I think that more resources, more investment, more artists and activists and scientists need to be working together so that we can start coupling these things because uh, communications is not just a human right. Again, it's also a pillar of health. And the last thing I'll say, if you don't remember anything I said today, if you could just remember this one thing, that the stories you tell yourself about yourself shapes how you treat yourself. The stories you tell yourself about yourself shapes how you treat yourself. And how you treat yourself shapes how you interact with the people and planet around you. And especially right now during COVID, and with rising inequality and social injustice around the world, communication skills building is the most critical thing that we need to be focusing on, in my opinion, because it affects the SDG goal of mental health and well-being. It affects the SDG goal of quality education. It affects the SDG goal of uh, uh, fighting for more gender equality around the world. These things are crucial. And it starts with the stories you tell yourself about yourself. So words are not just words. Words are actions that carry energy 
that shape choices, behaviors, changes your heart rate, changes the neural networks in your brain, how you process and perceive things. It, it's, it's critical. And I'm honored to be on the forefront of innovating practices that use storytelling communications to enhance and affect change at a psychological level, but also at an agency and community level too. Thank you guys so much for hearing me rant. I appreciate you. Thank you, Mosin. Um, I just want to say that I love that you're not a scientist. Um, and, and I think sometimes looking at these issues through that type of a scientific lens, um, the things we talk about just get so detached and abstract. And I think your heart, your work brings the heart back into it and, in, and offers really important, insightful perspectives of things that scientists are missing. Um, and I'd also just add that I'd love to hear you and CV have a conversation about empower lo local communities because I think you might be on the same page there. Um, and and I agree that that that's why collaboration between scientists and people who are affected, people like you, um, by these issues is so powerful and so important and so necessary. Um, and it's something that I'd like to see a lot more of, uh, too. Um, so we will continue this conversation, um, but our last speaker today is uh, Kivenya Tiena Kuhn, who's a youth activist and co-founder of Tilly, a game-based learning tool focused on developing metacognition, empathy, and critical thinking skills. She works with the United Nations Youth Advisory Panel and holds a master's in learning, design, and technology. As an instructional designer, she has experience in both user experience research and learning experience design, and she has training in design, anthropology, and film, which informs her approaches to creating products that help us reimagine our everyday for a more just and equitable future. Her talk is titled Designing Impactful Social Emotional Learning for a Safer and Happier Future for Every Child Everywhere. Thank you, Trisha. Um, also, my name is Kavindea Tenakun. Um, I'm a little um, about my pron the pronunciation of my name because my mom is very concerned about it. Uh, she's like, I spent so much time naming you, pronounce it right. Uh, so I know she's not joining me today. So that's good. Um, uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, to the organizing committee, Priya, Trisha, for putting this together. Um, and uh, I think Mohsin set such a high bar. And I'm just like, should I just leave this call right now? Um, and I totally agree with you. I think the SDGs is, is, is just a joke. Uh, honestly, thinking back, uh, it's just a bunch of rich white people sitting in a room deciding on what the entire world should be striving towards. Um, and there are so many people who've been so disillusioned by it and the amount of money that's spent on it. Uh, but I think it's great that we as young people are coming together to have a critical conversation about it and how we can put uh, sort of uh, practice into action. Um, so thank you for that uh, precursor. Um, I unfortunately have slides. Uh, I don't have a great uh, voice as Mohsen does, so I have to have slides to retain attention. Um, what I'm going to talk, uh, talk to you today is about um, a little bit about Tilly, uh, which is a game-based social emotional learning tool. Um, and I think more than that, just to uh, give a primer into social emotional learning and how we use a design-focused approach to building Tilly. Um, and I thought that would sort of be an inspiration to others who might be doing work in this space uh, to see how different approaches of how we can build learning tools. And uh, the third intention of this presentation, um, I come from the tech space um, and to really talk about how we can make emerging tech work for us. And by us, I mean uh, practitioners, activists, educators who are working in the global South of how we can make emerging tech work for us and not just um, the people in the Silicon Valley. Um, so these are some of the three sort of big intentions of my talk today. Um, so I want to begin with this quick question to you of, just think of a rough number in your mind of how many children in the United States are feeling unsafe right now at this sort of very moment during this presentation. Um, and the reason why I pick United States is because we always talk about the global South, about India, about Sri Lanka, about uh, the, the African continent, 
when we talk about unsafety and child abuse and gender-based violence, uh, but many of us don't talk about sort of the global north. Uh, so think of a rough number in your mind of how many children are feeling unsafe within the 60 seconds of my next few slides. Um, think of a rough number. That's right. There are six children at any given moment of 60 seconds just in the United States feeling unsafe. And by that, we mean physical, emotional, uh, psychological unsafety, whatever unsafety means. Uh, there are six children at any point in time going through this. And if you look at, if you look globally, uh, if you take any two, two to seven year olds, there is at least one of them. If you take any two, any two, two to seven year olds who have experienced violence at any point in their lifetime. And I think the pandemic obviously exacerbated what's going on. Uh, but I think what we're having now is sort of a global health crisis almost. Um, and this has always been the work of Tilly as well as my personal North Star of this constant question of how can we prevent the creation of a perpetrator? I think for a long time, we've talked about, we've talked at victims, we've told them how to be safe, we've told them how to protect themselves, uh, we've told them... Um, you know, how to learn self-defense, uh, which is critical, crucial skills. But I also think um, as a survivor myself, I've always gone back to the question of how could the creation of that perpetrator be prevented? And um, the reality is that these conversations about bodies and power and consent, often in communities like mine and across the world is really often completely avoided or approached with a lot of hesitation. Um, and I sort of wanted to go back uh, around seven years to sort of where my work started. Um, I worked in uh, the sort of child education, uh, grassroots education space. I was born and raised in Sri Lanka. And for about seven years, I worked with about 2,500 kids, talking to them about good touch and bad touch. And then I moved into sex education because I thought the answers may, be, may, may lie there. Uh, so I worked with young people from about 20 plus communities testing different models of uh, sort of comprehensive um, sex ed. Um, and I think with all of these experiences, what I realized was it was ineffective because if it didn't lead to behavioral change, if we were unable to see and measure and understand the changes that our interventions were bringing in, uh, then my question was then really, what is the point? Um, and when we talk about sex ed to young people, it was way too late uh, because children had already begun to develop these very strong mental models of, of consent, of trust, of bodily autonomy and all of that. So by the age of 15, it was way too late uh, to start these conversations with kids. Um, so I went back to kind of this North Star of what are the skills and mindsets a young person should have to first recognize an unsafe situation, ask for help. And secondly, and more importantly, what skills and mindset should a young person have to never create an unsafe situation for someone else? So there are almost these like two sides to the same coin of how we can prevent um, all forms of violence against children and create a more sustainable solution that sort of breaks the cycle right where it begins. Um, and we at Tilly decided that we want to focus on five to 10 year olds because this was such a crucial sort of cognitive growth and developmental window that was often missed because we tried to have these conversations with kids when they were 12 or 13, which was way too late, late and the bus had always gone uh, by. Um, so we used what we call a social emotional learning approach to it. Um, I know we have a very different mix of an audience. Uh, so I didn't want to assume prior knowledge, but I think uh, people in the psychology space have a really good understanding of what this means. Uh, but for those who are new to this space, uh, social emotional learning is really giving children and adults the ability to understand, manage their emotions, their relationships with themselves and with others around them. And we recognize these five main pillars of what constitutes a social emotional learning. Um, what we did was we really looked at all right, what are the skills? 
what does this look like in a classroom? What does this look like in a one hour learning experience? How can we translate social emotional learning to very tangible learning experiences for kids in classrooms in their homes? And we also tied back to our initial North Star of how can we prevent the creation of a perpetrator? So we really um, hit on three crucial skills, uh, metacognition, critical thinking, and empathy. So for us, these were the three make or break skills that would really give children the skills and mindsets that they need to be aware of situations around them and to avoid unsafe situations, but for more importantly, to not create an unsafe situation for someone else. Um, I'll quickly brush through what these skills mean for us. So metacognition is really giving children the ability to think about their thinking. So we train them to be aware of their inner thinking processes. We constantly train them to ask why. Uh, we teach them how to be aware of subjective experiences. And we help them articulate why they're thinking about a certain topic in a certain way or a certain person in a certain way. Then the second skill set is empathy. This is really for to train children Oops, it looks like we're having some technology issues. Just give us a second to see if we can get Kavinya back online. Understand the live reality of someone else to ignore. Trisha, is that better? Yeah, I, I don't know if um, perhaps if you uh, stop your like visual, it might help or you could share your screen, but yeah, that might help your internet connection. Is that is that OK now? I can hear you. Yeah, OK, awesome, sounds good. Um, all right, so um, the next portion was to really walk you through how we, I come from a design, I'm a designer by training, um, and to really talk about how we use a design approach to creating uh, TILI and building this learning intervention. Um, so we first started with this approach of need finding. Uh, we did an audit of all the tools that was available in this learning space. Uh, we went into spaces like UNICEF, trying to understand how they were approaching this issue of um, violence against children. Um, and then we ran what we call co-creation sessions. So we brought together social scientists like yourself, psychologists, teachers, parents, and most importantly, kids. And we asked them, what does a learning experience that would teach you about emotions and safety and consent look like? What are the topics you want to talk about? Um, what kind of an experience should it be? And then I was also able to kind of bring in these sort of seven years of working experience working with kids and young people to really see what was working and what wasn't working. Um, so this was sort of what our need finding and co-creation process looked like. And then we moved into this uh, aspect of really understanding what were their must have, what are the topics that had to be spoken about. Then we asked them, what are topics that brought discomfort? What were some topics that made you feel uncomfortable or unsure about? And then we asked them, where do you think learning would happen? What are the learning spaces that you're thinking about? Are they classrooms? Are they more informal learning spaces? And then we asked uh, them, who is the target learner? Should it be kids? Should it be parents and teachers? Should it be public health officials? Should it be government officials? Where do you think uh, who should be taught these, these critical skills? Um, so these were some of sort of the take backs and feedback we got. Um, then we went through, in design, we say prototyping. So we went through three rounds of designing um, a series of different learning tools and iterating. So we would prototype something, we would put it in front of kids and parents, we would test it, we would improve it, and we would go back. Uh, so we did this back and forth of prototyping and testing. Um, so right now, uh, Tilly has been used by about 220 learners 
um, and 150 parents and teachers playing Tilly with their pair, uh, with their kids. Um, and we've tested in around um, eight regions in North America and South Asia. Um, so these are some of the kids and how the testing looked like for us. Uh, there is an analog version of Tilly as well as uh, a physical version of it. Um, teachers are able to curate it and make it their own. Uh, so we don't prescribe it. We just give the content and the learning, uh, the formats, and they're able to make it their own. Um, and finally, this is what we sort of ended up with. Uh, we use the game-based learning approach. Uh, we utilize AI to really measure how learning is happening. Uh, we use AI to measure the child's cognitive growth uh, so that we're able to give a very personalized learning experience for every child and also give parents and teachers the ability to understand what social emotional learning is and for them to have personalized tips and take control of their own child's learning. Um, so I think this is how we're trying to um, make uh, big tech and emerging tech work for us and work for communities like us uh, through technology that is affordable and accessible to every learner everywhere. Um, so to quickly show you, um, Tilly goes through sort of these four learning steps, it starts with learn, uh, where the child gets access to um, some key learnings and mindsets. So this module is about trust. Uh, so they learn some frameworks around trust, some questions they can ask themselves, some frameworks they can use. And then we go into this application phase where they get 13 case studies or stories where they apply what they've learned into some real life problem solving. Um, and so this is where we're able to actually measure, has learning happened? What is success? Has a child been able to internalize this learning? Would they be able to apply this to another real life scenario? And then they go through this process of reflecting and applying what they've learned into their everyday life. Um, and finally, we're able to show parents and teachers how the child's learning has progressed and what they can do to improve. Um, so these are some of the impact metrics we found. Uh, we have great completion rates and parents having honest and meaningful conversations with their kids sometimes for the first time. Um, and this is just to summarize our five big, uh, sort of our sort of four big learnings. Uh, the importance of intentional design, always asking why we're doing something, focusing on the last smile because that's where learning sometimes fails and the ability to creatively define and measure what success could mean. Um, so that's been our learning over the past sort of one year, two years building T. Um, and that's the for you. Um, happy to answer any questions afterwards. Trisha, over to you. Thank you, uh, Kavinia. And I apologize, I'm, I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, uh, I really appreciate you highlighting some of the ways that technology can be designed and utilized even during quarantine to build skills like empathy and perspective taking, which I think we all agree are really important, um, and especially at a young age. So we have uh, only about seven minutes left for discussion, uh, and because of our limited time, I'm going to be posting the names and emails of our speakers into the chat, so you, if you have questions, you can connect with them directly. Um, but I guess I just wanted to start off with uh, a question I think touches a lot of the speakers today, both uh, Priya, Kavinia, and Mosin all highlighted how um, some strategies to promote self-awareness uh, and process some really powerful emotions. And, and Mosin, you specifically highlight the asymmetries between who's implementing the SGs and interventions and who's affected by them, which I think highlights a lack of self-awareness. Um, I was wondering if any of you guys could comment on, briefly on some of the barriers to self-awareness across these different contexts and the strategies that you found to be important to overcoming them. Um, I'm happy, to, you know, at, at the at the community level, uh, and I hope I'm answering your question. Uh, at the community level, uh, amongst the the populations that we work with the barriers to self-awareness are literally not being comfortable listening to your own body, being afraid of your own body because you've never been given a space to actually learn about breathing and controlled breathing and how to breathe. So like one of the exercises we have uh, that's necessary to have repeated over 
a period of time, you don't just do it once, is listening to your body through controlled breathing. So abdominal breathing exercises where you scan your body from the head all the way down to your toes and you listen, and someone mentioned this earlier, without judging. It's an introceptive awareness exercise, but you're also practicing how to do some controlled breathing techniques that can help regulate your heart rate and reduce variability in your heart rate, listen to your body without judging it. But we don't just end it with a scan of your body because what we see with as a barrier to self-awareness is just your brain is, especially for chronic stress and traumatized communities, your brain is writing a story to your body that is coming from a perspective of uh, survival mode. Like just you're stuck on the survival mode of communication, which means everything is a threat or it has to be defended or there's shame and guilt come into play, which is a huge barrier for self-awareness because if you're so riddled with shame and guilt, you can't even, you don't want awareness, man. You wanna deflect. So the external stuff becomes much more prominent instead of the internal. Um, but over time we see that even just teaching them how to breathe and listen to themselves and then write, consciously write back a positive strength-based message back to one part of your body over time, people have referenced in the self-assessments post-intervention after six, eight weeks together, that their ability to regulate their emotions improves, their aggression towards their children or their peers is reduced, and their judgment of themselves is so much less than what it was before that. So just at a community and individual level, just something as simple as listening to your body and breathing and providing actual techniques for interoceptive awareness, I think is extremely important. And then the last thing I'll say, and I don't wanna take other people's time, is just the, the, way, the way that the, I worked at the United Nations in the Department of Public Information. I had the honor of working there and I love the UN, but the way that we're approaching communications is oftentimes worrying too much about the results of things the, the, the result and the output instead of the process. And if you're results oriented and product oriented and transactional oriented, uh, you're only going to transmit injustice and inequality instead of transform it. Transformation comes from process and the process has to come from the people and the people that are living with chronic stress and injustice and shame and guilt every day, not from UNHQ and Midtown in New York City. So we got to be in the business of transforming and not transmitting. And oftentimes communications and self-awareness and SDGs and all this stuff is approached to communities from the UN as, as a transmission instead of a transformation. And that transformation has to be led by the brothers and sisters that we're all honored to serve and work with. I see a, a lot of head nods. We only have a few minutes left, but is there anything else that anyone in the panel would like to add? Okay, I will. I think uh, maybe bringing a collective consciousness is something very important to uh, uh, for the moment, actually. Even like that's what like we are trying to do, like how we can bring the collective consciousness. And uh, the some of our initiatives are like a focusing towards like bringing the collective consciousness. Even our own like the visual SWAT model, making people to be self-aware and bringing that collective consciousness to act for their own issues so that like it can, it may not be like a just a, as, as Mosin was saying, you know, like it's not like just a transmitting, it's a transformative. And, uh, and that resonates with the work we are all doing. And thank you. And that also relates to the idea then of empowering people, right? And uh, giving them consciousness, but also like this form of collective efficacy of feeling able to uh, to address the the problems everyone is everyone is facing so uh, that was really it was really insightful to listen to all of you and uh, also for me certainly a lot to take away well i wish we had more time but we are running up uh and and so i wish we could continue this conversation but i hope we we do continue it offline um I wanna thank everyone for attending the event today. Um, thank you for your presentations. A special thanks to Priya who organized um, this event, um, which I am grateful to be a part of. Um, and, and I hope that some of the speakers that, uh, that we see the overlap in some of the things we presented and that we stay connected 
uh, in the future. So I will, I'll, I'll be sending emails, um, but enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for coming and let's all talk soon.